Welcome to the house. Thank you, thank you. What a pleasure to see you. Yeah, it's a great house. Where's your head at these days musically? Like, what do you, I mean, when I, when I heard the invasion stuff, I thought this is awesome because this is just, you do so many different things, but this one just seemed like you could just round out another part of your musical identity. Yeah. Um, I listen to a lot of non-guitar yeah. mu music. Like a lot of electronic or clap? Well, m more like industrial stuff and like early synth music. And just, I think that uh, from, from doing the last Refuse record and just, it's so riff heavy. There's so many guitars. There's so much guitar <laughs> going on. I was just like, I need to, you know, I need a, another input. Yeah. And then when we started writing the new Invasion record, I was just like, um, we wanted to make it more percussive and more rhythmical and not like kind of strip away the guitars and not mm -hmm. write songs based on guitars. Uh, so that, that's kind of where my head is at. I mean, I always listen to a lot of punk and hardcore and music, but, right. but as far as like my latest discoveries, a lot of in the industrial, like weird German. And what, what did you, I love that. What weird. did you find in it? Like what were the, what were the things in it that really, that you could, you could latch on to? But I think it was the the rhythmical aspect of it, yeah. that it and it wasn't um, also that it, it's not conventional songwriting. I got you know also sometimes you get tired of like the verse chorus verse yeah. chorus kind of yeah. kind of thing. So there was something about it that was just so non-linear and so uh, kind of messed up in the arrangements that it, that was just almost free form that mm -hmm. I really liked. And I was like, I mean, Invasion doesn't sound like that, but definitely you can take aspects of that and, and make it so it's not, so not every song is just like every other rock song in the world. Did you, I mean, you have an identity to so many people in a cup for a couple of different bands. Is that a, can that be limiting and can that trigger that kind of exploration? I, for me, I don't, I don't think it's a limitation at all. I do think that it can be a limitation of, of, of other people's perception of me. Yeah. And people be like, oh, it's a guy from Refused, which is, you know, generally what people recognize me as. And then, uh, and even sometimes when it's like, when it's band like Invasion, that's so different. Right. You know, it's not, nothing like Refused. And then people get kind of bummed out. And I'm like, well, that's the whole point of like being a, right. a human, that you're not a one dimensional character. And I'm always been, if, if, if even listening just to Refused or Noise Conspiracy or whatever, every record sounds different yeah every record is a step in some direction this one doesn't sound like inc no, and there's members of inc all. in the band yeah 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 and it's i mean it's just about for me i think punk rock for a lot of people or any genre for a lot of people it becomes a definition definition of who they are and it, it kind of like especially punk it's like for some people it's like a small small room yeah. <laughs> and then they're just like this is where i'm going to spend the rest of my life but for me, discovering punk was the opposite. It was like, it, it blew the roof off. It right. tore down all the walls. I'm like, discovering punk was in my mind the idea that anything is possible. Who did you discover? Who started that? I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of different, you know, when you're young, because it's not. How old are you now? 45. Yes, yeah, so I'm 45 too. Yeah. So we would, we would come in the same run, the, yeah. same, the same shoot. Yeah. Okay. So I was, uh, I was a metal kid. Yeah. To me too. Totally metal, like I was into like uh, the early thrash, like Anthrax, Metallica, all yeah. that stuff. And I discovered what we categorize as crossover because it was kind of adjacent to metal, but it wasn't as technical. Right. I, th I think that for me, like like being a young kid, and I was I was not I was not a talented musician when I was young. I was very limited in, in my yeah. musical range because I was like interested in hanging out with girls and driving my moped and doing yeah. stuff like that. And, and most metal people, they're just kind of like lonely nerds that fiddle that around <laughs> in the room and they get really good at playing their instruments. I was not like that. Right. So when I discovered like punk and hardcore and I was like, it had the same energy. It was like, it had traits of metal in it. Like, especially like the, you know, like the crow mags or crumb yeah. suckers or early, yeah. like that, that kind of New York hardcore. Even crossover. black flag stuff. Dude. Even black flag yeah. like, and, and, and uh, DRI and yeah. stuff like that. And then, um, I mean, that led me into punk and hardcore. But, but I remember, here's a story that I told before, but it's one of those, like I was into kind of metal and a little bit of punk and I had an exploited record. And you know, like, it, it's just like, you're trying out different things. Yeah. And I remember going into the city and I bought Dead Kennedys, uh, Gimme Convenience, Gimme Death, the, the singles collection, weird yeah. record. 
and I put it on and the first song is Police Truck. And I remember being 15 years old, putting the needle on, on the vinyl and thinking, never, nothing is going to be the same That's ever when I again. heard Crass. Yeah. I was 14, I heard Crass. Crass, that's insane. And I was like, there was a 13-year-old girl, played it for me on a cassette, and I remember thinking, that's not even a melody that I've ever, I'm in. Yeah. It nev- not, and it, it fucked me up. Yeah. Music it changed, yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, and Dead that, Kennedy's words, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that song, and I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. And I knew, I mean... Because like being into metal, it's 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 one of those deals where it's like, I I it, you're a rebel, but sort of with other costs. And I always felt like a freak and an outsider. But then just discovering punk, it's like it was some it was like someone had created a culture for me. Right. They're like, here's this is perfect for you. And then you know, I was one of those kids who like had long hair. And one day I just came to school with a fucking mohawk. I'm like, <laughs> fuck you, I'm a punk. And uh, yeah. And I, for, it's 30 years ago. Right, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> what was happening politically in Sweden at the time when you were a kid that, that fueled that? Or was it international? I, I think when I first got into punk, it wasn't, it wasn't politics. It was just a sense of complete fucking alienation. Yeah. Living in a small town where I was from, from early age, I was just a freak. I was one of those freaky kids. Yeah. Like there, There's one in each class that's just like the weirdo. Yeah. And I was one of those kids. And... and I don't think it was politically motivated. I wasn't really invested in politics. I was just the sense that I was such an outsider. And then punk came and it said, yes, you are. Yeah. And that's fine. Right. And I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> it is. And then through the Dead Kennedys and through just, you know, punk rock and hardcore, that's when I discovered politics. I was like, like all this sense of alienation just made my, my eyes open. I'm like, oh, wait, it's, it's, you know, the world is a really terrible and fucked up place. And uh, I got all my education. I didn't, I mean, I didn't finish school. I was just like complete, you know, yeah. you, you can, by my sharp intellect, you'd think, you know, this, this guy has tons <laughs> of university <laughs> points, but, but none, none. I was, you know, like a high school dropout. Yeah. And I and, learned, learned from music. And you started playing then? Yeah. I'm still, I played a little bit before. I was like in like half-assed metal bands. But as I said, I couldn't really... I was a bass player, and I was like, ah, I don't want to practice that much. And then punk came, and I'm like, I, I can, think I can do this. And this I can sing. Seems feasible. Is that when you knew you could sing? No, we had our first band, and we just played instrumental because no one wanted to sing. And then someone said, I mean, we gotta have a singer. And I'm like, Yeah, I guess it's gonna be me. And then I, I, I started singing. And how <laughs> long after that did Refuse happen? Um, four years ago. Four years four after later. me. Four years after, yeah. Uh, so this, I started '87, and refused. Started like '91, '92, like right. around that time. So a couple of years later, I had a band called Step Forward. That was like a proper hardcore, fast, minor threat s kind of hardcore band. Yeah. And um, David, that played drums and refused. He's this metal kid, and he was one of those guys that was like. Everyone, his music teachers and everyone told him, like, you're going to be, like, a, the next great jazz drummer. And, yeah. You know, like, you're bound for greatness. And he went to a show um, to, to see some cover band play. And, and we played with Step Forward. And they were just like, all right, I'm going to be a punk. Yeah. And so he became a punk seeing me play. And then I moved, so I moved uh, an apartment next to him. Right. And he lived with his parents, and then we started hanging out, and then we're like, yeah, we should start a band together, and we started Refused. That's unbelievable. Yeah. When did those songs start to happen as a writer? Because, you know, for a lot of us, we heard a song here or there, but it was really Shape of Punk to Come, and we hadn't heard punk songs like that. No. When did you find that sound? I mean, that, that record is, I mean, at that point, we've been a band for a couple of years, and... Uh, I think the record before that, the, the record's called Songs to Family Flames and Discontent, was mm-hmm. like our first, the first time we had a, really our own identity. Like a, a lot of the early stuff is, it's, there's some cool songs, but it's also a lot of songs that sounds like other bands, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where you're just like, you're, try, you're fumbling in the dark, you're like, oh, let's try this. And then, but, but Songs to Family Flames, we did that record, and it was a great record, and we toured. I think we had like 200 shows on that record. That's and, a lot, and it kind of destroyed the band to start because it was like just too much. But we did, we, we toured America in 1996 with Snapcase and just coming over here and, and, and like uh, the, the culture differences. And also, just we were super political. We were one of those bands that just like, like just blah, 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 politics. 
and snap kids were not and and uh, most people we met were like the the straight edge kids were very apolitical yeah. and they were a bunch of them were kind of jocks and, and very narrow mind I yeah it was yeah very and, and and we were just like whoa we're from a different tradition we're from a european like like a cultural sort of a aspect of politics and culture and so we really clashed on that tour. I mean, Snap Kids are great guys, and they're fantastic. Yeah. But at that tour, we didn't get along because we came to America, and we're like, I mean, granted, I was screaming, like, let's burn down the Statue of Liberty in yeah. one show, and they did <laughs> not take kindly to that. They were not pleased with me. So we were kind of being dicks as well. But just coming home from that tour and, and feeling like uh, what, what happened in the, in the hardcore scene at that time, you had, like, Victory Records that were our label. Yeah. And they were a very apolitical machine of, of like kind of macho hardcore. Yeah. And then you had like the whole like ebullition and like heart attack record, like, like the sort of emo screamo yeah. thing of the 90s. It was very political. And for some reason, we just, we didn't fit anywhere. No. Like all those political punks are like, you on Victory, you're a sellout. And all the people in Victory are like, oh, these political faggots from, yeah. you know, yeah. Sweden. And we're like, what? So we didn't <laughs> fit anywhere. And so we went home from that tour. And it's one of those, because I always had a sense of, a, a, a belonging to a scene. I was like really proud of like, right. I'm, we're on the hardcore scene, we're doing this together. And just coming home from that tour, I was like, I was so disillusioned, I, di disillusioned yep, that's right. with everything. So when we started Shape of Punk to Come, it was like, it wasn't like we were like, let's let's call it that to to like, you know, it's not a prophecy, it's just like a middle finger. It's yeah. like, fuck you. That's what I took it as. And fuck your narrow-minded views <laughs> and hardcore <laughs> and, and fuck all you believe in. And, and, and it was, it's the pretentious record. Yeah. Because uh, we were just like, we didn't try to please anyone. We just, like, we want to make music that was just like so, I would say like beyond what people would comprehend. Right. And, and granted, like it came out and we started touring in 98 and we went on tour in Sweden and no one showed up like all the hardcore kids were just like oh, fuck these pretentious bastards yeah. like what the fuck are they doing and we were horrible in a lot of I mean I remember one show we played we were playing like half of the set and then we walk off stage and we put on put on Serge Gainsborough shit tam in the PA for like five minutes and a friend of ours walked out and he started talking about politics and existentialism on stage, and the kids were just like, "What?" The f and then we went back on yeah. and continued playing. We, Pink Floyd used to do that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, but we were not Pink Floyd <laughs> by no stretch of the yeah. imagination. So, so it was like when we did the record, it was just like a reaction to, to America, basically, to to yeah. what we felt like the 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 constraint of the scene, and and you know, and then we broke up, and when we broke up, like. We did not break up as a band that's like, yes, we did it. We broke up as a band that's like, yeah, I guess that failed miserably. So interesting. The, first, the last tour we did in the States, it was like the venue we played tonight with Invasion, yeah. that would have been a big show. A big show. Tour. Yeah. I mean, we played cafe, uh, cafes, we played record stores, we played basements. I mean, it was like one of those like... It was like the crustiest of crusty tours. Wow. And we did we like four shows and then we broke up and then we're like, we couldn't afford to make it because we, we flew into DC and we couldn't afford to kind of just go back. So we had to do another five shows as a broken up band. So it was the most awkward thing. It was just like, we walked on stage, we're like, yeah, we broke up three nights ago we're in Atlanta and now we're playing wow. again. Wow. It's so interesting how that works because I'm sure you've, it, the mythology, I wonder when the mythology reached you because here, <laughs> Right, you break up, Burning Hearts, whatever, at that point, their label. My friend who worked at Epitaph calls me one day and says, it hadn't been out here, it calls me and said, you got to hear this record. So the, I'm like, sure, and I trusted her to the end, Yeah. right, Tony. From Tony, Tony, I know Tony. Yeah, I trusted her to the awesome. end. Awesome. She calls me one day and she says, you got to hear this record. I'm like, all right, if Tony says that, yeah. she gets it to me that day. And I put it on, and she said, listen to New Noise. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Where are they from? She goes, here's the thing. They put up the record. No one cared. They broke up. Yeah. And now <laughs> we're going to make sure everybody cares. And so we started playing it on our show, right? We started playing. Like, oh, I had a late night show, but we yeah. played it. The shit out of it. We played videos. Yeah. When the video came out, we yeah. played it on, the, on our Much Music channel. And Tony and I were just like... We noticed that every band I interviewed, yeah, every band I interviewed in that world, I said, where's it at? And every band said refused. 
<laughs> this is like now the year 2000, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1999 to, actually 98, no, 99, 2000, yeah. 2001. And while you're at home thinking it's a complete failure, yeah. over here in our world, we had never heard anything like that. Yeah. When did that get back to you that something was happening? Well, Do you want water, by the way? Should we get your water? No, it's fine. Sure? Okay, it, it was, I mean... I'm in restless soul. So we went, I mean, I went home and I started noise conspiracy right quite immediately after we broke up and, and we toured a little bit, mostly in Sweden to start with. But then the first time we came over here, which must've been maybe 2000. And that's kind of, I mean, when, when we broke up and, you know, we started noise conspiracy, I had friends that called me and they're like, your videos on MTV yeah. every day. I'm like, what? That makes no sense. <laughs> but so then when we came back with noise conspiracy, that's kind of when it hit me a little bit because, you know, people came out to the show and they're like, oh, that was a great show. I love Refused. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa. And, and so that's kind of when it started dawning on me that, wait, this is something, something's happening. And, and, and it was weird because I was, you know, you immerse yourself in a new project. And I wrote that, um, I wrote that super pretentious manifesto about burning all our pictures and not answering interviews about Refused ever. So I was like, wait. And then people didn't want to talk to me about Refuse because they're like, oh, he'll, be, he'll get pissed if yeah. we mention Refuse. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. So it was weird because I was so immersed in noise conspiracy. Yeah. And then, like, we were doing really well. And the same time, like, Refuse is, like, following us, like, this, this albatross. And I'm like, it was the weirdest thing. But in noise conspiracy, I thought was timed so beautifully, and you probably didn't do it on purpose. But suddenly, the, <laughs> the rise of political issues in North America, people started to connect yeah, more yeah. to politics. And so noise conspiracy comes over. Yeah. And... Rock punk against Bush, like yeah, yeah, yeah. things were changing yeah. here, and it was like a perfect time for you guys to walk yeah. back to this and, country. And for like two minutes, there is also this whole like there like a, a wave of garage rock happening yeah. with the hives and white stripes, and yeah. we sort of like we're yeah. like oh we can ride in on this one a little bit, and so so yeah, I mean we did we did pretty well for a while there with that band, but I'll tell you this is a yeah. good story. Not that many people know that. First of all, uh, when we did the record. Um, the, the Shape of Punk to Come, yeah. I did not want to record New Noise because it was out on a compilation already. Right. We did like this, uh, we, we had a record label and then we put out a, a, a compilation called Straight It's Just Fuck Volume <laughs> 3. Just that in itself. But So New Noise was on that one, like an early version. Yeah. So when we're recording the record, I'm like, nah, I don't think we should have because it's on the comp, so you know, it's not going to be exclusive for the compilation. But I got talked down to the other guys and refused. Like, no, we should have new noise on the record. Yeah, because they knew it was something special. Yeah, they knew it was. I mean, we all knew, but I yeah. was like, you know, just being kind of an idiot. And then the second thing that happened is that we were going to shoot a video for the for the for the album. We knew this, and we had our friend, uh, this guy that played in uh, plays in a band called Teddy Bears, and mm -hmm. he was in a band called Caesars, and he's like a, and and we told him we wanted to make a video for uh, Liberation Frequency. And he calls me up and he's like, no, 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 New Noise. That's the song we're going to make the video for. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, that's the jam. And, you know. So then Much Music, I was interviewing <laughs> bands and every video started to look like New Noise, which yeah. I thought was really funny. I'm like, it's, it's crazy how this doesn't happen very often, maybe no. once in a lifetime. Yeah. And it's a song that all of it is just shit you didn't. Had you stuck to your guns, you would have made a mistake. I totally. Yeah. I, I'm the first to admit it. It would have been horrible if people would have listened to me. Yeah. We would not sit here talking today. It's just how it was, you know. But I'm glad. I'm glad people heard something. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, it's a fantastic song. But it, it's weird when you're so you're wrapped up in it, and you're like, no, no, that's you know, that's the old. And was the first song we wrote after the previous records. Right. Like, oh, it's like the old song. Right. Know, but, uh, the Refuse for fucking dead EP, poetry written in gasoline, all this stuff was out there. Yeah. Right. And there was this mythology band, and then they're done. Yeah. I loved INC because, uh, and you were actually on our old show and the new music because we, I mean, we wanted bands to be about something. Yeah. And did you, and you found the audience at that point. So when you were over here earlier talking politics, there was no audience. No. And then you found that they were listening to you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to a certain extent, that it, it's like it, the thing is like we do art. Yeah. We do music, we talk about politics, but at the end of the day, like when you go to a show, it's not up to me what people are going to bring from the show. Right, yeah. Like, I mean, I wish, I mean, Noise Conspiracy, we, we really made an effort. We had like, we had book tables on tour and we were really like, yeah. like <laughs> pushing it to people. But at the end of the day, I think 
the politics did matter. Yeah. But we were a good band. We were really good live. Really we good looked live. cool. I mean, it was like a combination of all these different things that that made it, you know, a, a, a great band. And one of your band members joined against me. Yes, yeah. he did. And play yeah. here. They play a concert all in this house. Well, he plays everywhere all yeah. the time, yeah. so it's it's impossible to keep track on that guy. Yeah, because he's, he's rather busy yeah. at this point. Um, when Invasion, so you have Refused, <laughs> then you have this shadow following you, then yep. you do INC, yep. and it does pretty well, yeah. and now you have two shadows following you yeah. as you get into something like The Lost Patrol, but, but like Invasion. Yeah. So now when you come to Invasion... Where was your head at as far as how what the identity of this band is going to be? Well, I, when we started the band, it was very unpretentious. It was it was like uh, by design, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was one of those deals where where all of us were playing in different bands, and we wanted a band that could be unpretentious and could be like, yeah, let's just you know fuck around and play music. But as it grew, and and when we actually changed the name to Invasion and became like a real band, it were like, well, oh, this is kind of cool, and then. Noise Conspiracy stopped playing, and Andre, they played drums, he had a hardcore band, and they kind of fizzled out, and all of a sudden, this is like our band. Yeah. This is our only band. And then, like, early on, we knew we wanted to go in kind of a darker direction, because that was just, you know, just where our head's at. And uh, when we got Sarah to join the band, which is like five years ago now, I think that really kind of cemented the identity, and with her voice contrasting my voice and she's her really, bass playing. And she's important. Yeah, she's a super important. Super important. <laughs> yeah. She's a part of the first, was it girl hardcore group in Sweden? In the world, probably. Maybe the world, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like really early. <laughs> yeah. She toured, uh, she toured America in 1995. That's amazing. She was like a year before me. She was my girlfriend at the time. She, what, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. For, for a long time. And, when she, and she was here and you were back in Sweden? Yeah. We are just touring the opposites of each other. Wow. Yeah. But no, she's important. I mean, she's one of those characters that like, she did Donuts and then she had some other bands and then she had Noise Conspiracy for years. And then she had the drummer from Invasion, Andre, they had a band called The Vicious. Mm -hmm. They toured America like twice, like total DIY punk. And then she had a band called Mass History, which also toured America. They sang in Swedish and she sang and played bass. That's when people started to realize how she could sing, right? Yeah, yeah. And then then she joined Invasion. Mass History broke up and she, I was like, Sarah should play an Invasion, and, and it was like the best move ever. And so if you're trying to use an internet search engine to find Invasion, there are no vowels in it. Yeah. Right, so there's no vowels, and if you're, if you're trying to search it. <laughs> yes. Just for, because it's art, right? No, <laughs> it's not. As, no. Uh, it's a super uh, simple explanation. In Sweden, we're called Invasionen, yeah. which is Invasion plus E-N at the end, Invasionen, which means the Invasion. Right. And then when we're going to release the record and sing in English, we're like, we need a name that's not super awkward for people to pronounce. Right. But then there's like a million bad bands called Invasion. We have Vin Vincent's Invasion, yeah. amongst others. Which is great. Which, you know, it's it's debatable, but it might be great. It was great. important to somebody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so our drummer just said, let's just spell it I-N-V-S-N. And then in Sweden, we can still, still say Invasion. In right. And in the States, we can say Invasion. So that's the only reason. So it's inclusive. Mm-hmm. And there, and and so you dark. That makes perfect sense. But just so if you're searching them online, then you know how to find out this band. Yeah, um, I N V S N. Does yeah. the refuse thing still? Because when Coachella happened, yeah, I was in neither in Canada or the United States, and someone called my, my friends who we, we like you know dance music. I like electronic music. I like all kinds of music. But somebody texted me and said because I hadn't checked the Coachella lineup, and they said. Um, I think that band you like is playing. And I'm like, what band? And they said, and they didn't know. And then they sent me, they said, I think it's refused. And I said, well, no, it's not refused because that's never going to happen. Exactly. So what's <laughs> happening? And then he sent me the poster. Yeah. And I looked at it. I was like, come on. <laughs> Why are you doing this No, to me? <laughs> no, it was more like, that's never, it's like when the Stone Roses played, I thought, yeah. I thought I would never see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, fuck it. I'm, I got up, I flew there because I wasn't planning on going. I fucking flew to see you guys. And, the first or the second weekend? I saw though. the second weekend. Oh, good. <laughs> right. It was, a, was it a better show? Yeah. Really? Much better. You take the stage, and it's awesome, and it's a bunch of guys, young and old, that were there, a lot of women too. But then when I heard the guitar of New Noise, it was like lemmings to the fucking hill, the cliff. <laughs> people started climbing over each other, and I looked around, and I thought, this is 30,000, 20,000 people here. Yeah. I don't know the last time... If refused to ever play to a show like that. <laughs> no, never. Right? I think we did, uh, in the 90s, we did... A couple of festivals in Sweden, a couple of thousand people. Yeah. But I mean, mo most most of the shows look like the one with Invasion tonight, like were you 150 capacity, 
Well, I mean, I wasn't. I mean, I knew over the years how the legacy had grown. I knew over the years that people were pretty excited. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I have to admit, when, when we put when I posted on my Facebook wall, we just posted a photo of the four of us, and it says "Refuse 2012." Yeah. That response. That really <laughs> fucked me. That messed me up. Really? Yeah, because I was like, well, people will be excited. And it was like <laughs> on Twitter worldwide, like the second biggest news that day. It was everything. Yeah, it was everything. And my, 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 in, my fucking Facebook exploded. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man. I, and at, at that point, so here's the, here's the crazy part. We hadn't practiced. We'd taken a bunch of photos we had not practiced, and we posted the photos, and people fucking lost their mind. Did you mind. all like each other still the whole time? Did you ever have any of those bad feelings towards each we other? We had a lot of bad feelings really? for yeah. a lot, a long time. But, <laughs> so, but we posted the photo, and people lost their mind, and I'm like, oh, shit, what have we done? Yeah. But then it turned out pretty great. So when you met for the photos, <laughs> yeah. were, you, were you all friends? Yeah, yeah, at that point. That yeah. had been fixed. Yeah, yeah, that had been fixed. And at this point, you have other music. I mean, music. it's been 12 years or something like that. Right, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you, have, you had other music that you were doing. You had other things that you were doing. Yeah, I was doing Invasion yeah. at the well, time, yeah. Did you hesitate? And did the people in Invasion, did, you know, how'd they feel about you going back to that? Well, I think everyone's fine with it. I think it's one of those deals where now I try to keep it. I mean, I tour with Invasion, yeah. working on new Refuse materials. Yeah. Tour with Refuse, work with Invasion stuff. I mean, that's kind of how I, I set it up. And I think the people in Invasion... At that time, I think they were a little bit bummed because we were just kind of starting to find our identity. And I'm like, I'm taking out with Refuse for a year. Yeah. And they're like, what? And then they were also kind of excited. Like, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And I kept it a secret for everyone for a long time. It was super hard to like. It was it weighing you down? Yeah, I was like, oh, man. I'm, and I was like, I'm going to do. And yeah, just like <laughs> being secretive about it. But it was, me and David have been talking about it a little bit because we had a hardcore band called AC4 for a little bit together, yeah. just playing like fast hardcore, just for fun. Yeah. And we sat and speculated and we're like, well, what if we do Refuse? And he was like, yeah, it'd be kind of cool. And, you know, it wasn't like we were opposed to, because for a long time we were super opposed to the idea. We were like, we got offers for years yeah. and we always turned them down. And then when they got the offer and, and David calls me and he says, uh, I'm going to talk to Chris and John, don't, don't talk to them. I'm like, oh, cool. And in my mind, I'm like, it's never going to happen. Was this the Coachella offer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. Then like two or three weeks go by, and then David calls me, and he just says, yeah, we're doing it. Wow. And I remember, I'm like, I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah, we're doing it. And then, yeah, and then we did it. How would you feel when you got that call? I had my knees buckle. I'm yeah. like, holy <laughs> shit, are we doing it? He's like, yeah, we're doing it. I'm like, oh, all right, I guess we're doing it. And then. I had to go back and listen to the Refuse record. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. We could do this. <laughs> I love the INC stuff. I love the Invasion stuff. I love the Refuse stuff. So I, to me, it's it's great to hear you being able to do, and continue doing these things. Yeah. Um, then the Refuse tour happens. Yeah. And then new Refuse material happens. Yeah. Is it hard to... What's the challenge of compartmentalizing that? Uh, I think the, the problem is that... Uh, like, to not let... To not be fooled by your best ideas, because mm -hmm. sometimes you're like, "Oh, this is such a great idea. I should save it for for refuse or save it for invasion." But th I don't think that works. So once we got into rotation that we're going to do new refuse material, I was very careful with um, separating the entities with with refuse and innovation. So it's mm -hmm. like whenever I'm in creative writing mode for refused, I make sure that there's no invasion creativity going on. I mean, touring is fine because that's a different thing. But yeah. And, and that's what's happening right now. We're, we put a record out with Invasion, you know, like three months ago, and then we're going to tour for a year. Yeah. And we just started writing Refuse songs. So now I'm going to go into that creative mode of, of, of Refuse writing. Mm -hmm. And then when that's done, then we're going to start writing Invasion songs. So that, I think that's like the hardest thing. But the, the, the bands are so, uh, in essence, they're very different. So it's easy to like separate like myself in them. I mean, I did. I did one weekend where we did a we did a refused show, and I I got on I got in a van. I drove for like two hours. I got on a plane and I drove for another hour and did an invasion show. That was weird. Yeah, it was like the same day. I'm like, mm. that's crazy. But it it's it's it it's fine. It's the the energy of the music is. I mean, it's still a lot of energy, but it's a different type of energy too. So it's fairly easy to. Um, and does it still feel you? 
when you hit 45, you were on stage at Coachella and you said that you wrote these songs when you were basically a kid. Yeah. And you wondered if they would even mean anything to you later. Yeah. And they still do those songs. But what motivates you intellectually now? Because you know you said you wanted a different kind of sound. But yeah. for what you're, what you're talking about and what drives the band as a, as a tone. I mean, it's so easy. Like, um, I think that if you make it, make it, make it, that's when people get lazy. I mean, yeah, Refuse did a year where we did the reunion tour, but then it just worked again. I mean, putting out a new record, touring that record, it wasn't 2012, I'll tell you that, like in a good way. Yeah. And I've always been, you know, always been the kind of guy that, so, I mean, tonight, this is what my life looked like most of the time. Yeah. And I'm fucking fine with that because... I think it should be a struggle because you're talking it, about a smaller venue. Yeah, and you're smaller working for your venue. Money. Working. Yeah. I mean, I work to to make people excited what I do. And you're okay with that because some guys. Yeah, I mean, I mean, 2012 was weird. We walked yeah. on stage. I said hello, and it was it was it, we won. You yeah. know, it was like a walkover. <laughs> Every game was like a walkover. Yeah, you know? and and um, it's a bit uncomfortable because I like the struggle. I like yeah. when you go on and you play. At the end of the set, you have them. Yeah. I like that feeling. And uh, where does that come from in you? I don't know. Revenge. It's always revenge. Yeah. I think revenge. Love and revenge drives everything. Bullies, bullies in school that thought I would amount to nothing. Really? Yeah. I guess. Did you uh, get a lot of that? Yeah, I was. I was the only punk in <laughs> in town. So yeah. Did you get beat up? Did you fight for yourself? Or was it violence? Yeah, there was. There. I mean, it wasn't like horrible, but yeah, yeah I get people bullied me. People thought I was an idiot. I was kind of an idiot. I was kind of a dick, but you know, like it was still not really called for. Right. I was the guy with a mohawk, you know, in school, and people just did not like it. Do you take? Do you take the responsibility? Do you take on the responsibility of making sure that you create a safe space for other kids now? Yes, I like, I, we try. Yeah. I mean, both when we play. I mean, Refuse is so violent. It's such the the music that we we perform is so visceral and it's so like. It's so aggressive. Yeah. So when we play, I always make sure that there's no violence. And then we always we talk a lot about like a lot of issues and make people kind of realize that we're to respect each other. I mean, invasion it's easy because it's such a it's more I wouldn't say mellow that'd be a lie, but it's a different vibe to it. It's more dancey, not violent. No, it's not violent at all. No. In fact, even the imagery when I look at the T-shirts and all yeah. that stuff, I like I see '80s bands. I yeah. see like a, I see a very different imagery yeah. with yeah, that yeah. as well. Yeah. But you have to uh, sort of, um, I mean, it's one of those things where I grew up, when we went to punk shows, that was the, the most dangerous place in town. Yeah. It's not like that anymore, which is know. really nice. I sometimes miss it. I sometimes miss that energy of like, you never know what's going to happen. But, but it's nice that people can come, as I, I talked about that tonight, we can come together and this is something that we're going to share. It's a communal aspect that I really enjoy. And especially when you play the smaller clubs, because you can look people in the eye. You can talk to people on their level. It's not, I mean, when you play Coachella or festivals, it, it's a bit strange because you're so elevated from, yeah. from a pretty, like, faceless crowd. Right. But tonight it's like, all right, we're all here. We're, let's talk, you know? Sure. I we're, like that. We're old enough that we were, we were still young for the 70s when it happened. Yeah. But we remember when punk in the 80s, right? Yeah. The wave. And then yeah. there's the 90s wave. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the 2000s wave, which yeah. was more radio friendly and had yeah. a thing. And what wave is we at? Is there a punk wave right now? There's not, I'll tell you what, there's not a huge one in North America. No. That, that's breaking through at all. There's not a lot of venues for them to break through. No. But have you seen a wave at all? No. No. I mean, I, it's, it's a bit weird. It's a lot of retro, a lot of old bands. It's kind of doing... The same thing over and over again. We got filled with bands from Sweden, punk bands. Yeah. I think they were all actually in the refused, they were in the wake of your band. Yeah. <laughs> and they were much softer and much more radio and I had a lot of time for them. Yeah. And a couple of artists told me that in Sweden at the time, band was a class. Like there was rehearsal space and mm. it was really supported. Yeah. Did that influence, did that have an impact on you, Kat? Were you part of that? Yeah. I yeah. mean, everyone that grew up in Sweden, if you wanted to play music you can go to like a youth center mm -hmm. they had a practice space set up full with equipment you play music you can play music and if you wanted to start a band they said all right we'll get you a practice space we'll borrow you a pa you do study circles and that's where you can hang out and that's what we did when we started a band like 
when most people went out drinking, we, we went to our practice space and we, we practiced and play music and you can borrow like a PA, you can borrow some equipment and yeah. It's an amazing way to keep kids in the system to like keep them. Yeah. And when you look like at- in a good way. In a good way, yeah. 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 When, it, it, when there's funding cuts or bullshit or the politics in the States, even to a degree here, the first things that go are the arts. Yes, always. They never come back. No, they you don't. Know? No, so that really affects, I think there's so many good bands from Sweden just for that reason that, we always had access to practice space. We always had practice uh, access to like, like kind of like com- communally uh, city-run venues where you could play like youth centers. I mean, that's we played our first forty-five shows was at youth centers, just like youth clubs basically. I mean, that's where you played, and there was like no drinking, no no drugs allowed. It was like all ages. I mean, I refused in the nineties. I think we played somewhere between five and six hundred shows. We played two shows where there's an age limit to the wow. door. Because we're super, we were like, we're not going to play if it's an age limit. Why? So we never, I mean, I remember one time we played and we showed up at this some really small hick town in Sweden and they were like, oh, it's like 18 plus to get in. And we're like, that's not going to fly. And they're like, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. We took all the equipment out on the parking lot and we played in front of 10 kids that's that couldn't get in. Dennis, we're just like, wait, so you need this music. And that's I think that best. really affected the way we, we view, you know, the music. And, it, and to come back, yeah. I mean, one of the things that drives me is, is I'm so curious of what happens next. And I love music. It's like we can talk about politics and we can talk about social structures, economical structures. But I love music. Mm-hmm. I love to immerse myself in music. I love to be part of music. I love to let music fill me and project it onto other people. And I, I'm a curious person. Mm-hmm. I always want to see what happens next. And... It's weird. I'm I'm 45. I've been playing music for 30 years, and every day I feel like I'm learning stuff. Every day I feel like I'm a better singer, better songwriter, better lyricist, better performer. Every night, and it's a good thing. Dude, I'm fascinated by the concept of old lions. You know what? What do yeah. you do when you're old? Yeah, I mean it's tricky. Yeah, because yeah. really, a lot of the stuff that we herald, like I, we had Jackson Brown in here the other night. He was playing, and somebody asked him about a question, a song. And he's like, I wrote that when I was 16. Yeah, I'm like oh my god. Yeah, that blows your mind. Paul Anka, teenager. Yeah. yeah. And then, so when you're making your best art as a grown up, yeah, that's a different place. It is a different place. Is it a, a different challenge? I mean, it's a challenge. I mean, rock music is a young man's game. We all know this. It's it's a young man's also. You know, it man's exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's it, it's definitely a challenge. And I mean, uh, we I mean we face that with invasion sometimes because we're like we come out and we're like we people that have been around for a long time. And the magazines just go like, nah, we'd rather write about these 19-year-old girls yeah. than a bunch of 40-plus people that have been playing bands forever. Yeah. So sometimes it's it's a bit of a you know a challenge to get over that. But at the end of the day, I think that uh, you know the experience that you bring to the table and what you have. And I mean, you know, also as I said, don't get lazy, mm-hmm. don't get comfortable. If you keep pushing yourself, it will sh- show in your art, and if that shows in your art, people will find your art. I mean, you know, and if, honestly, if, if I started doing this to become rich and make money, <laughs> yeah. I would have bailed a very long time ago because it's, it's never been about that. It's no. been about like, today someone called me from Sweden and they said um, they're, they're going to do like a big David Bowie thing in the, in the huge arena. And they asked, do you want to sing two Bowie songs? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, hell yeah, I'll do it. And then my manager called and he's like, what are you going to get paid? I'm like, what paid? I don't know. I'm just singing David Bowie songs. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he got me paid. I didn't even think about it. I'm like, I'm just going to sing Bowie songs in this arena. It's going to be great. Well, hopefully right, your you know? manager did the Coachella deal and not you then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he did the Coachella yeah. deal. I, if, if it would have been me, it would be useless. It would have been yeah. done. Yeah. You talk about it, and, and we won't keep you much longer. I appreciate you coming so late. But the idea of gender. Yes. I remember, again, it wasn't just refused, but there were a few artists and only a few that were... Fugazi and post Fugazi, mm. where gender issues were being talked about, mm. and you know, coming up from metal and being a guy in a very male—I was raised mostly by women, so I didn't mm. have a, you know, that was mostly my my life. But I, I didn't learn about gender issues mm. until you know late teens, and music played a role in that. It was actually Beastie Boys when when they changed. Oh yeah, MCA started becoming, and you're like, oh, yeah. oh fuck, what does that mean, right? Yeah. Um, and for you guys, that was always important to you. Yeah. When did you learn that? Well, I mean, just, just being a part of, I think the, the, the political punk and hardcore scene in Europe is very different from America. Yeah. I mean, Europe has a tradition in politics that's so, um, 
it, it's so ingrained in the culture. Like, you know, I grew up and then we had East and West Berlin. And then one day it wasn't like that. And, you know, <laughs> know. it's like a, the, the, the economical structure changed. And so people don't remember there was a place called Yugoslavia. Exactly. I yeah. mean, that that's our reality. That's what you yeah. grew up in. And, and, and uh, systems change. And, and while in America, North America, it's been a very, it's a culture based on a utopian idea. And, it, and it, nothing really changes in that month. But so I think we came from a different perspective and feminism was something that we talk, talked about early on. I must admit, I don't think we practically knew what it meant. It was more like, you know, we we're feminists. We talked about that. But then I mean, just being around women and especially now, like playing with, with a band like Invasion, where you know, for a while we had three girls in the band and we saw how that affected people around us and how they got treated differently. Yeah. And, and it became one of those things where we really need to raise these, this issue, especially in the punk, hardcore sort of metal scene, because it, it's a musical scene that's so, we like to beat ourselves on the chest and be like, we're so open-minded, we're so like, you know, everyone can be here. And then you go to festival and it's 98% dudes. Right, and, yeah. and that's just how it is. And uh, it's a cultural thing that needs to change from somewhere. And I think just by being a band like Invasion, you have Sarah and Kiki. Like, I think them on stage and their presence is worth 10 million flyers. Yeah. Because you see them and you're like, oh, that's what I want to do. So with Refuse and with Invasion, we try to play with bands that are female-fronted all the time. Mm -hmm. Every support band we brought out, pretty much every support band we brought out with Refuse the last couple of years have been female-fronted. Just not like uh, like in your face, but yeah. more like just these are great bands. Yeah. And then hopefully we can inspire people. And then when we talk about feminism, because I do talk about feminism quite a lot, I try to approach it from the perspective of a white man uh, from a privileged position where I talk about feminism with other men about men. Yeah. And women, I mean, they know these structures because they live them every day. And we are in the position of privilege, so that therefore I need to talk, we need to talk amongst each other. Because it's like, it's not up to women to change us. Right. It's up to us to change ourselves. Right. And then together we can have a, like an equal world. So I try to approach it from that perspective. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the voice of, of women and feminists. I'm a voice of myself mm -hmm. and other men. And that feminism that we could represent. And I think that's an important uh, sort of distinction. And I think that's it's an important thing thing to talk about because we, we claim that we have this equal world and it's it's not at all. Was that in your family? When did you grow up with a home that No. That's weird. Like my parents never talked about politics. They were very mm -hmm. ape they were one of those families that like they didn't ever said what they voted. They were like, "I'm not going to tell you who I voted for." Yeah. Now, now it's we whip them into shape because I have two <laughs> other two other brothers. They're punk punk kids. Yeah. We're it's a we're a family of punks and yeah. vegans. So <laughs> maybe I'm yeah, yeah. They 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 didn't stand a chance. But, yeah. <laughs> so it's not from my family. It's it's just like just from learning and from having a lot of uh, female friends, basically mm -hmm. just seeing the structure and see how it affects them. And just a weird fact, like if you start asking your your girlfriends your female friends, how many have been sexually abused or, or, you know, inappropriately, you know, everyone. Made to feel unsafe. Exactly. Everyone. everyone. And that's, everyone. <laughs> and that's as a man, that's insanely scary. Cause you're like, Oh, that's, that's how women see men. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to see. Cause I don't, I don't walk down the streets thinking like, what if someone comes up and talk to me? What a bummer that would be. Yeah. So uh, just, just being around, my girlfriends and you know that just you learn a lot just by listening to them and I think also the key thing for us men listen to women listen to I mean we love to mansplain yeah. we're sitting here right now mansplaining yeah. the shit out of things but we, sh we need to listen because I think yeah. that's a fucking key to to understanding why the world is as the next time for invasion bring the whole band and let me hear them yes let's hear what they're you yes. know yes yes it's always funny because we always joke about that because they are they're shy and they're self-conscious about their English. Yeah. So it's I'm kind of like the spokesperson. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you going to talk about feminism, but we're, we're here. We're women. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Next time, bring them in. The, uh, in you can translate for them if, if there's something we don't understand. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. Um, so musically, Invasion carries on for a while. That's yes, in your head, yeah, right? That's your yeah. band. That's my head. And right now. you're making new Refuse music. Yes. How far along are you? Pretty far. I mean... Uh, we have a bunch of uh, songs written, and I think we're we're starting to record. 
we're going to do a bunch of sessions and see what comes. But right. I think we have a bunch of songs, and we're going to start recording pretty soon. You, dude, you got to bring that band and play in this house one day. Yeah, we'll make it happen. If it ever happened, that'd be yeah. amazing. Um, what an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Anytime.